word says, praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. From this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its going down, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who dwells on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in the heavens and in the earth? He raises the poor out of the dust and lifts the needy out of the ash heap, that he may seat him with princes, with the princes of his people. He grants the barren woman a home like a joyful mother of children. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we gather together this morning, may our hearts be full of thanksgiving and praise to you. May our minds be focused in, on worshiping Jesus and hearing from you what it is that you have for us this day. Help us, Lord God. Teach us, Lord God. Love us, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is numbered. Amen. Well, as Kathleen mentioned briefly, we went out to Pittsfield for, on Monday, for the Christmas holiday with our family. Everybody was together, all of them. Tennessee, Albany, and Worcester, and Douglas. And we had a good time. Big house, big. There was 12 of us and there was still one bedroom that wasn't used. <laughs> there were two bathrooms and two laundry rooms and two kitchens and it was just, it was immense. It was an Airbnb thing. And um, it was wonderful to have everybody together. There were too many presents, of course. But um, one of the things that I noticed and perceived in being with my family, and in particular my girls, was that they don't need me the way that they used to be, that they used to. Things change over time. Uh, relationships and just how we interact together, they're different than they used to be. And that's not always easy because of just the way that it's always been and what we became and what we become and how we've always acted and interacted together. And I'll give you one example in particular. And I, th I praise God for the sensitivity to be aware and give me the ability to stifle some of my instinctive reactions of what to do. One of the bathroom tub drains st stopped draining. And as a result, excuse me, don't forget to silence your phone. <laughs> One of the bathroom tub drains stopped draining and um, my oldest daughter Joanna came down and said, the upstairs tub drain won't, doesn't drain anymore. Does anybody have any ideas? And of course, well, did you try plunging it? <laughs> yeah, of course we tried plunging it. Oh, and then my next step was, well, I'm gonna go find a plunger and I'm gonna go try because maybe they just didn't do it right. <laughs> well, I found a plunger and as soon as I looked at it, I said, don't you dare. Don't you touch that, let it go, walk away. And I did. And then I began to notice that they were interacting together very well. Julie is suggesting some concoction of chemicals or natural remedy on how to unplug a drain. And, and Jessica is looking for a Phillips head screwdriver to take off the thing because she knows the thing behind the thing is where the thing is. <laughs> and um, and Joanna, Joanna says, it seems like the, it's, it's blocked and the plunger didn't work, so we think that maybe the thing got disconnected. And I said, well, what you'll find if you get that 
off is that there's a, usually a, a, a cotter pin there and they rust out over time and you need to replace the cotter pin or get something to secure the, the little drain plug to the lever. Well, lo and behold, they couldn't find a screwdriver so they used a knife or a pair of scissors or something like that. And by the time it was all done, it was, it was done and they fixed it and they found it and they didn't need my help really. And that's unusual, and that's new. And just even in the relationships, you know, when they were growing up, I couldn't get them to help with anything. And there were promises, oh, I'm gonna help you do this, and I'm gonna help you do that. Well, they were never there, seldom there, to help dad, but, you know, now they send me texts, if you need any help with uh, cleaning up after this storm, you, you let me know, please. I'm serious, Dad. I'm serious. You let me know. Now they're pursuing me and making me feel guilty if I don't call them and tell them to come down. So things change over time. And it made me think about how in our relationships things change, but in our relationship with God, it really never changes because... Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, when I was baptized, the church had a tradition that you would pick a verse and you would say, this is my life verse, if you will. And that was the scripture I picked. And this was back in, when did we go to the Assembly of God? Late 80s. Late 80s, yeah, mid to late 80s, probably. And... Um, well, no, maybe it was early 80s. I think that's what I said. Yeah, yeah, it was because we were there when we were in college. So we're talking late 70s and early 80s. And um, that was the verse that I picked. So it's always stuck with me, and it is one of the most popular verses or the, best, best, the most well-known verses from the book of Hebrews. And so I began dwelling upon that verse and thinking about it, and said, I've never really done a message. I've mentioned it a hundred times in my sermons, but I've never really done a message on it. And as I began to just do some research and start to feed my brain with ideas and things that other people have written about that scripture, one thing I found out is it's the fourth most popular scripture chosen for the first Sunday in January, you know? And I had never thought of that before, and I says, well, I am not a cliche kind of guy. I am not going to preach on that this morning. And then I ended up coming back to it. So anyway, I, want, I do want to go and have you turn to Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21, as we consider the whole concept of Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Verse Luke 4, 14 through 21. Jesus had just spent 40 days in the wilderness being tested by the enemy and giving himself fully in his will to the Father. And after that, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And news went out through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, 
gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This was the beginning of his public ministry as the Messiah. And what we see in the stories in all of the gospel record are what Jesus did and who he was. And the list would be too long to go through in entirety. And I chose this because this was the starting point and this is where he said, this is who I am. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And we see so many instances throughout the gospels where Jesus preaches the good news of the kingdom of God, the good news of freedom from captivity, of forgiveness from sin, of the loving kindness and compassion of a heavenly father who gave his one and only son to save the world. It says that he gave sight to the blind and how he transforms lives. And he cleansed lepers and the lame walked and the deaf heard and the mute spoke and the dead were raised. In fact, when John the Baptist says, is it really you? He sent this word back to him, the lame walk. It's blind see, the good news is preached. He touched the untouchable. He hung out with the unspeakable. He touched men in places in their lives, literally and figuratively. And Alistair Begg wrote this word, putting his finger at the point of their greatest need. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Putting his finger at the point of their greatest need. And each of us has a need. The greatest need of all is salvation. Being made right with God, knowing that our sins are forgiven, we are cleansed, and we are being sanctified and purified to glorify his name and to do the good works that he has prepared in advance for us to do, such as comforting those who we can comfort because of the comfort that we have received. He fed the hungry with physical bread, and he fed the spiritually hungry with spiritual bread. He taught them truth in the simplest terms. He communicated with people in ways that they could understand. I think of the story of the foundation built on sand or built on solid ground. A simple story, a basic concept. You just didn't build a house on sand. You built it on solid ground. And that is how he taught the people. He communicates with them. He communicated with them in ways that were completely understandable and relatable. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You do not need to be a Bible scholar to understand what the Spirit says to your soul through his word. Yeah, the love, uh, another scripture that has been haunting me and is from John chapter 1 said he came full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Full of grace, full of grace, full of love, 
full of kindness and compassion and embraces, never pushing us away, always drawing us to him. He initiates the contact, even when we are untouchable. Grace and truth, loving, forgiving, and the great shepherd of the sheep leads us as we walk through this life, making the decisions that we will. Same yesterday, pretty clear. We see it in this book. Today, he is the same as he was then. And here's what we read in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He appears in the presence of God on behalf of us, his children, in all matters in everything. In Hebrews chapter 4, the famous line about the throne of grace, he says, the word says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we profess, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way that we are, Yet he was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When the weight is too heavy to bear, when the testing makes us scream at the heavens, I can't do this anymore. I can't handle this. When the pain is excruciating. Remember, he has gone through everything that we have. He has understood everything that we have. And the thing that is the most important to him is that our faith would not fail. That is what he is concerned about. That is what he intercedes us for us. That man, he fell down again. He failed again. Father, I'm picking him up and I am dusting him off. He needs encouragement. He needs grace. He needs mercy. Because this is hard for him. And I don't want him to be discouraged. I want his faith to endure and grow stronger through us, through faith in what we provide for him and what we want him to become. I think of the story of Peter when they were sitting around after the Last Supper and they were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Well, when, the, when they all got done with what they were talking about, Jesus went to Peter and he said, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. There it is in the essence of what I'm saying about how he is the same today as he was yesterday. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. He prays for us that our faith might not fail. That we would get through the failures Trusting in his loving kindness, compassion, and faithfulness to us in all things. No matter what we are, he is greater. And he will never 
leave you or forsake you, no matter what. That's an amazing thing. And he says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. He didn't say, and once you've gotten through this, gird your loins because you're going to be a great leader of the people. No, you will humble yourself and say, I failed, but Jesus forgave me because of who he is and what he is. And that is the humility of a servant leader that is required of those who God calls into his service, that they would be humble and willing to admit that they need him for strength rather than they are strength. What a beautiful thing. What a wonderful God. It's about him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, even as he intercedes for you and for me, just as he did for Peter in that moment. And it says, strengthen your brothers. You know, there are times when I want to give up. Forgive me for being so honest, but it's true. There are times when this can be overwhelming. And I have a pile of the cards that you've given me over the years. Many of them with a little personal thought. Everyone here in this room has shared that with me at one point in time or another. And I am so grateful for those because they strengthen me. I read through them and I come to the one that I needed right then and there. He uses us to strengthen each other so that our faith will remain and persist and continue because that is what is most important to him, that our faith in him would never fail and that we would always look to him to be the source of our strength. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Matthew, he told the disciples, heaven and earth will pass away. But my word will never pass away. His word will never pass away. He told them, I will never leave you or forsake you. Fear not. Fear not. There are people the people in the world do not have that kind of assurance, that certainty about what the future holds. Do you remember the group that did the House of the Rising Sun, the animals? The keyboard player was born in England. His name was Alan Price. And he wrote a song to the tune of... What a friend we have in Jesus. He was a church going boy. And the story I read about this song is like, wow, how could he think that way if he went to church? The lyrics go like this. Everyone is facing changes. No one knows what's going on. And everybody changes places and still the world keeps moving on. Now love must always turn to sorrow and everyone must play the game because it's here today and gone tomorrow. But the world goes on the same. What a dismal thought, all to the tune of what a friend we have in Jesus. Well, that's not the truth. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as the psalm that I wrote, uh, I spoke of, Psalm 113, at the beginning, he looks down on his creation, and he is coming back, and we can be certain of that. And there's an, another song I'd like to create, to quote to you. 
It's called, Oh How Sweet the Glorious Song. It's an older hymn. And the words go like this, Yesterday, today, forever, Jesus is the same. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. All may change, but Jesus never. Glory to his name. That is ours. And as we approach this year, let us remember that he will never push us away when we come to him. And he touches us, puts his finger at the point of our greatest need. And he is never afraid to cleanse a leper or to heal a crippled soul. We seek him for that, that our faith may grow strong. Let us encourage each other with these words. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you that in Jesus we discover that all of our full all of your fullness is found and that we are complete in him. We pray that on this first Sunday of a new year that these simple and yet elemental facts may undergird whatever we're facing personally or in our families, uncertainties about our future, and so on. Please help us to this end, we ask it. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Now receive this final exhortation and benediction. And now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all God's children said, Amen.